you know the scripture, you keep going uh, with it. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're going to be in Luke 5. And again, uh, if you are, uh, need a Bible, we have uh, those Bibles. are going to be in page 808, staying there, Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 32. Let's have a word of prayer before I start, and then uh, we'll dig in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity uh, to come to your word, to look at Jesus, and to see the beauty and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and these three interactions. I pray uh, that we would have a greater appreciation for who he is and what he's done as a result of your word and the work of the Spirit today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was good to be back. Um, we had a good time away the past few weeks doing the whole California thing with the kids, and we pretty much did everything Californian you could do in California, except we didn't do skiing and and uh, going to the beach in the same day. That's kind of like a, a thing they always brag about. But it was a good time. See friends and family, uh, enjoy some of my favorite foods uh, while we were out there. Also, thank you to Justin and Andy who preached uh, while I was gone. They did a great job. I pray that you all were blessed by their messages and that um, God was using and continues to use his word no matter who delivers in your life. And uh, it's really encouraging to know that God's equipped our church with so many good teachers I can get up and teach. Uh, many pastors I know scramble when they're going to leave. I don't have to worry <laughs> about that. Make a couple phone calls and we're good to go. Um, also really encouraged that God's moved in our midst to get behind that love your neighbor uh, move going forward over the past few weeks as I've been away. I've thought a lot about that ministry, reflected on it, and I really think it's important for us and good for us to move forward with this outreach. I think it's important for us to invest in a young family for ministry and to strengthen the ministry of El Club as well. Uh, all are important ministries for us, I think. And uh, I think it's good for us to, to grow and to start asking and acting in light of an extraordinary God. So I really believe that these are important things for us. So it's exciting to see. Please uh, continue to pray for the ministry here. Continue to pray for that ministry in particular, that God would be honored and glorified. So we're back. We're back in Luke, and we're in Luke chapter 5, as we read this morning. Originally, I did map out we're going to take all the way to chapter 6, verse 11. That's why the original scripture reading was going to go that far. But as I kept studying this section, there's just too much here. There's too much I don't want us to miss about who Jesus is and the things that he does in the passage in front of us. We, we might miss some stuff by slowing down. Sometimes it's really good to get a big picture. But I really want us to slow down and see each of these interactions and spend some time so that we see the beauty and glory of, of Christ as we take it a little bit more slowly. Puritan pastor Nathaniel Vincent said, Christ is not truly prized at all unless he's prized above all. And I want us to prize Jesus above all. Um, but we're only going to prize him if we understand who he is and what he's done. And in a sense, that's what Luke is all about, right? Luke is all about showing us who Jesus is. That's why this whole series is titled, Know Jesus, because that is what we need more of, to know Jesus, to understand who he is in greater depths, and to grow in our appreciation for all that he's done. And of course, to prize him above all else and follow him wholeheartedly. And I tell you what, the Jesus we see in these three accounts today should motivate each one of us to prize Jesus above all else. For some of you, this might be the first time that you really see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ as you look at these accounts, and I pray that you definitely see who Jesus is in his glory and, like Levi, follow in response to him. For others of you, I pray that this morning is a chance for us as we look at each of these accounts to get a renewed sense of the glory of Christ, to get a fresh reminder of the beauty of who Jesus is and prize him above all else. One of the things that I made sure we did when we went back to California was we got to get to Yosemite National Park. It's like my favorite place in the world. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And uh, I've been 10 years since I was, no more than that, it's been a long time. It's been a while since I was there. You should ask me about a disaster trip where we never made it there. And I remember it as beautiful. I've always, you know, thought, oh, I can't wait to get back there and do some of the things there. But when I got back there, there was just a renewed sense. Yeah, this place is 
pretty amazing. I mean, you feel like an ant with all the trees that are massive in their like normal trees to them. And then you look at the, the rock faces and, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I could climb that. You know, I would love to go up that. That looks amazing. And you see those powerful, you know, waterfalls that are going down 3,000 feet. And you think, man, this is just amazing. It really reinforced how much I love that place. I actually have a joke with my, I wasn't going to say it, but I told my wife, like, when I'm no longer kind of all there, just take me to Yosemite and let me loose. And I'll die in a happy place. And uh, she's worried about getting arrested, so that's not my, not my well-being. But, um, but for us who have seen the beauty and the glory of, of Christ, I, I pray this morning you get a chance to reaffirm that. Reaffirm that reality. We're looking at these three accounts. Chapter 5, 12 through 16 is the first. 17 through 26 is the second. Third one, 27 through 32. Uh, In this section of Luke, he's giving us an insight into Jesus' ministry. He's going to give us a bunch of different interactions that actually take us all the way to chapter 6, verse 11, before we start seeing some of the teachings of Jesus. And these ones in particular, I really wanted to slow down because they're going to shift in their focus Uh, with verse 33 and what's following. But it gives you an idea of what it was like. This is what Jesus was like. This is what he did. This is the type of ministry he had. This is the response that he got to what he was doing in Israel at that time. So we're going to look at each of them slowly, and uh, I hope uh, you will learn and love Christ more as a result. So let's start with the first one. This is verses 12 through 16. Here, Jesus cleanses. Jesus cleanses. Verse 12. Well, he was in one of the cities. That's the city of Galilee, most likely. Verse 12, there came a man full of leprosy. So Jesus is in Galilee, and a man comes to him who's full of leprosy. Both the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar. So Matthew and Mark have this account as well in theirs, but only Luke describes him in verse 12 as full of leprosy, emphasizing how bad a situation this was for this man who was there. Uh, Leprosy in the Bible covers a multitude of different diseases. The rabbis actually had 72 different diseases that they called leprosy. But the leprosy was what matters, not like what type of leprosy he had in verse number 12, but that he had leprosy. Because a person who was designated a leper in Israel was designated a terrible, devastating blow in their life. It's not simply because they had a disease which with there's no cure at that time and inevitably would take their life. So you have this guy, and I'll explain why it's so devastating in a second here. But look at verse 12. He comes, he's full of leprosy, and he makes a plea to Jesus. Verse 12, and when he saw Jesus... He fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me, now notice the next word, clean. He doesn't say you can heal me, but he says you can make me clean. It's a very important word. As a matter of fact, all but two times in the Bible when someone's talked about being healed from leprosy, it's talked about it in the terms of being cleansed from leprosy. The reason is this, for someone in Israel, In that time, with leprosy, they were considered unclean by the law. You can find out the instructions if you want on your own. You can go to uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 and find out everything that it says about leprosy in that passage. But there's all different instruction that it gives for a person. But one of the main instructions that you have in Leviticus 13 and 14 is that a person who had leprosy was considered unclean. They had to completely separate themselves from other people in society as a whole. And any person that came in contact with the leprous individual would then also be considered unclean. Leviticus chapter 13, 45 through 46, paints a picture of what it was like to have leprosy. The leprous person who has a disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And you shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. 
Of course, the reasons for such extreme measures was how contagious that disease was and the fact that there wasn't a cure at that time. But think about the impact that that would have on an individual who had leprosy. If they were married or had a family, they had to completely separate themselves from them. And we're not talking about go in the other room. We're talking about go out of the city completely. They could never touch them. They couldn't even be near them. They could never have friends that they could hang out with or laugh with. And the fact that this guy in verse 12 is full of leprosy means that it's been quite a while that he has been in this situation. Josephus, who's a historian back at that time, said that the banishment of a leprous person that they experienced in Israel was no difference from a corpse. They were that neglected. The rabbis called leprous people the living dead. That's how they were viewed. That's how they were looked at. And so you can look at this request in verse number 12, and you can understand why this man has to be cleansed. And not only that, you can hear the desperation in his voice. If your will, he doesn't doubt that Jesus can. He says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And what's interesting is this guy was so desperate. He's in a city. That's what it says at the beginning. He's in one of the cities, which means he broke protocol and ran into that. I don't know if he could run. He got into that city, and he fell before Jesus and cries out to him, can you make me clean? Make, you can make me clean if you will. He just wanted to be clean. Look what Jesus does in verse 13. He does the unthinkable. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. We know that Jesus didn't have to touch him to heal him. Jesus, later in the book, is going to heal ten lepers without ever touching them. We know from other stories that Jesus healed people the next town over without even going there. Jesus did not have to touch this man. So the fact that he reaches out and touches is pretty significant because, again, in the Old Testament, it's very clear that if someone has touched something or someone unclean, they become unclean themselves. Numbers chapter 19, verse 22. Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and anyone who touches it shall be unclean to even. Now think about this. Ever since this person knew that he had leprosy, he had not touched another human being and been completely rejected by society. And here, Jesus touches this person with compassion. And for the first time in this guy's life that he can remember for how long since he's had this disease, someone moves towards him rather than away from him when they find out he has leprosy. And this just speaks to the compassion and love of Jesus. He moves towards this man, touches him to heal him. That's not simply out of compassion, I think, that Jesus touches him in verse 13 when he stretched out his hand, touched him, saying, I will be clean. But as we pointed out in Numbers 19, if you touch something unclean, what happens? You get on clean, right? I mean, your kids don't miraculously bring their clean clothes into mud, and the mud just disappears. It comes on to them. But Jesus is different. the other way around. He touches the unclean, and the unclean becomes clean. Now, if you're unclean in Israel, what's the significance about that? Scholars kind of debate and talk about it. There's all different reasons that a person can be unclean, but at the heart of the situation of an unclean person is that they get alienated during their time of uncleanness from others, and they're unable to be in the presence of God in either the tabernacle or the temple. And Jesus does here what no other person can do. He touches a man who is unclean, but rather than becoming unclean himself, he cleans the unclean. The leprous doesn't infect Jesus. As I thought about this, I, I couldn't help but think 
that this is such a picture of what Jesus does to those who come seeking cleansing from our sins, right? We don't pollute Jesus with our sin, but he changes us as we become in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, for our sake he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. When we come to Jesus seeking to be cleansed from our sins, our sin does not affect Christ, but his holiness affects us. And in him, we become the righteousness of God in the presence and sight of God in making us whole and clean. When Jesus reaches out to us with his saving grace, he changes us. We don't change him. And so with this healing touch of Jesus, look at the end of verse 13. Immediately, the leprosy is healed. It's gone. The man is clean. So verse 14, he charges this man, tell no one. And probably the reason he tells him to tell no one is because of the crowds. We actually learn from the, the gospel of Mark when the word gets out. There's so many people, Jesus can't even be in the city. So he's probably telling them, don't tell anyone until you do this, especially, verse 14, what's that? Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing. Obey the law of God. When you were healed of leprosy uh, in the Old Testament, if the disease went away on its own, you would show yourself to the priest, and then you would have to make a sacrifice. You would take two birds and just so you don't have to read it, so you know what's going on. You take two birds, you kill one, you dip the birds, the, the alive bird in the blood of the other, let it loose, and then you would offer three different sacrifices, a sin offering, a guilt offering, and a whole offering. And uh, that's what he's telling him to do in verse 14, because again, Jesus obeys the word of the Lord, he obeys the law of God, and so he commands him to do what he needs to do. But verse 15 Word gets out, and actually Mark tells us that this guy didn't listen to Jesus. He couldn't help but tell other people about what Jesus had done to him. So verse 15, even more of the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. He starts to tell people what Jesus has done. People can't wait to see about Jesus, and so they come in verse 15, and Jesus, of course, in verse 16, withdraws to desolate places and prays. I mean, there's an example for all of us in Jesus there. If you're going to minister to others, you've got to be filled. You have got to be filled with the Lord and knowing him. And so he would go and get away in verse 16 and pray. And that's the first story, Jesus cleansing. And you can see the compassion of Jesus all over it. Look at the second story, verse 17 through 26. Here Jesus forgives. Verse 17, on one of those days as he was teaching, uh, Mark 2 indicates that he is in Capernaum, if you're a history or a geography buff. Capernaum at this time is probably where Jesus lived. He's in, in one of those days as he's teaching. He's teaching in someone's house, and among the crowd, look at verse 17, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. It's the first time we get to meet these guys in the Gospel of Luke. These are going to become important people. We're going to have to pay attention to the Pharisees and uh, the teachers and the scribes as we go through the book of Luke. But they're sitting there and they're listening. They're listening to Jesus in this house. And notice the end of the verse. A lot of people had come. They had heard about this. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And notice the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. He's making the point that Jesus was healing by the power of God. He was on a mission from God. And then look what happens. Verse 18 and 19. Behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Again, great crowds are following Jesus. They're in the house. They can't get in. And so look what they do in verse 19. Finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof. If you don't know anything about houses at that time, they were flat houses, and there was always a stairway up on the outside of the house to get in. And so they're trying to get in. They realize they can't get in, so they go up these stairs, up onto the roof, onto the flat roof in verse number 19. And look at they let him down in his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. I always like try to picture what that, you know, what that would have been like, because we know that there would have been dirt on there. I mean, it would have fallen. I don't know. But the point is that they're digging their way through this roof, which you would do, moving the tiles to put this man before Jesus. They just want to get this guy to Jesus. And look at verse 20. When he saw their faith. 
Jesus saw what they're doing and saw something. When he saw their faith, the whole group, he said in verse 20, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, Jesus, we know, knows the thoughts of people. You can see that in verse number 21 and 22. So he knew what was in their heart, and he knew that there was genuine faith there, and it's demonstrated by their actions and persistence to get this guy to Jesus. And the end of verse number 20, Jesus responds because he knows their heart, and he knows this guy's heart, and he says, man, your sins are forgiven. Now, we could try to parse this out. How does this all work? But the simple fact is this. This man demonstrated faith in Jesus, and Jesus forgives him. It's as simple as that. Jesus, knowing his heart, forgives this man of his sin. And in God's world, faith precedes forgiveness. God forgives us when we have faith in him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, that word justified there has the idea of part of justification is forgiveness of sins. How does that come? Not through works of the law, not through keeping the law and the rituals of the law, but through faith in Christ, through faith. We're forgiven of our sins through faith. You and I, when we come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done, are forgiven of our sins. Ephesians chapter 2, this is all grace on God's part. For by grace you have been saved through faith. We are saved through faith. We come to Jesus like this paralyzed man, no matter how broken, no matter how sinful you are. Even if you think you've sinned beyond repair, If you come to Jesus in true faith, he'll forgive you of your sins. No one's sin in this room is so great that God cannot save you and forgive you. None. I mean, think about the most well-known hymn of all time, Amazing Grace. You know the backstory of Amazing Grace? It's a hymn written by a man who is deeply involved in the slave trade, knowing full well that what he was doing was wrong. And when God convicted him of his sin, he came to Christ in saving faith. And the Spirit worked in his life. And that's why he says, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. We all are wretches who experience God's grace and forgiveness when we come to him in faith. So... Not only is Christ compassionate, as we see in verses 12 and 16, but he's forgiving, as this story indicates. Well, remember who's in the audience. Verse 20, man, your sins are forgiven. And they're in the audience, and they're hearing his declaration of forgiveness here, and it's not going to go unnoticed. They're going to call Jesus out on this one. The religious leaders caught what he was saying. And look at verse 21. The scribes and the Pharisees begin to question. And we know they're questioning in their heart because of verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts. So they're questioning in their heart. They're seeing this, right? You know those awkward moments when something happened and everyone's like, you know, that's what's going on. They're looking at what's going on. They're thinking in their hearts, what's going on? Like, and they question and they say, verse number 21, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Why is it blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now that's a great Question. That's the right question. Only God can forgive sins. That is true. Ultimately, our sin is between us and the Lord. It affects everybody else. I mean, look at the life of David when he sinned with Bathsheba. It affected many, many people. It affected the whole, actually, the whole country of Israel. But he recognized in Psalm 51, it was ultimately first and, most, first and foremost about him and the Lord. And he says, I, against you and you only have I sinned. That's why God is the one who can forgive. It is ultimately between us and God. No priest, no pastor, no televangelist can forgive you of your sins. And no one can absolve your sins. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Lord. So that's the right question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But what these religious leaders had failed to grasp is what Luke has been trying to show us all throughout this gospel. Is that Jesus could pronounce forgiveness because he's the son of God. He's very God himself. And they didn't understand that. 
And of course, since he's God, verse 22, he knew and perceived their thoughts. And he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? In verse 22 uh, through 24, look what he says. Which is easier? Verse 23, your sins are forgiven you or to say rise and walk. He's saying, which miracle is, is more massive to get someone to walk or to forgive them? So verse 24, but you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the paralyzed guy in verse 24. I say to you, rise and pick up your bed and go home. The point's pretty straightforward. If I can heal this paralytic before you, then what I have just done actually took place. I have forgiven his sins. That's what he's doing. So verse 25, immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God, of course he was glorifying God because of the forgiveness he had just received, because of the healing he had just experienced. And so now the religious leaders should realize who Jesus really is and not be questioning if he's blaspheming or if he can forgive. But this guy, look at his response. Went home glorifying God. I mean, how could he not glorify God? for the great grace he had just had, for the power of healing that he had just experienced. In verse 26, amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we've seen extraordinary things today. They're amazed because they had just seen something only God could do, and we would be the same. We'd be amazed if we witnessed something that only God could do, and we knew only God can do it, right? Right? If you were my, uh, here before my message of vacation, that's one of the things I wanted to, to get us to think about, to be a body of people who act in light of an extraordinary God. So when we see him do something, we say, only God could have done that. Even what we heard today in baptism, guess what? That's evidence of something only God can do to change us and save us. So the first story he cleanses, the second he forgives And now, look at verses 27 through 32, Jesus seeks. Verse 27, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. Now, interestingly, right off the bat, if you're a Greek reader, you realize that the word is saw. It's not just like a passing glance. It's a very direct word. The word for saw means he purposely looked at this tax collector, Levi, He was going after this tax collector. He was fixed on this guy. That's the idea. He sees this guy because he has a plan for this guy. Levi is most likely Matthew, or the Gospel of Matthew. He's most likely the same person. All the evidence seems to point that way. But notice in verse 27, he's a tax collector. There's different types of tax collectors in Israel at that time. We're going to meet a tax collector later. Um, in, uh, in Luke chapter 19 with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was kind of a head honcho type of tax collector. This guy, Levi, the word that's used there for tax collector, he's the lowest on the totem pole, all right? He's just, he's the low guy, all right? So already, if you don't know anything about tax collectors, nobody likes them. It hasn't changed. And, and then not only that, he's kind of the low guy on the totem pole. So he's like really not well liked. He was actually hated by the Israelites at this time. Joel Green, uh, in his commentary, notes that tax collectors were the social equivalent of modern-day pimps and informants. That gives you a feel for what people thought of these guys. But it's this type of guy, in verse 27, Jesus looks intently at, seeks out, and calls him to come and follow. He said to him, the end of verse 27, follow me. Now, look at verse 28. Levi doesn't even hesitate. Leaving everything, verse 28, he rose and followed him. He leaves everything, implying this. He's leaving his life behind to follow Jesus. This is a picture of true repentance in which he leaves who he was and reorients his life around Jesus. We know he's going to throw a great feast, so it's not like he sold everything off, and we know that he still had possessions, he still had a house, but he now has changed his life, reoriented his life, and changed even his what he's going to do, because he's going to be one of the 12, and he rises and follows Jesus. Jesus seeks him out, calls him out, and Levi responds by going out. Now, look at verse 29. 
Levi is now a follower of Jesus, someone who's met Jesus, followed Jesus, and now, verse 29, Levi made him a great feast in his house. There was a, a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. He had now experienced the grace of God. He had been forgiven, implied of a sin. He's now a disciple of Jesus. He follows him, and he invites his friends to meet Jesus. And who are his friends? Verse 29, tax collectors, very well-liked people, right? And others. Well, who are the others? Look at verse number 30. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled at his disciples, implying this, probably because we know the Pharisees and scribes would not enter that house. They probably waited till Jesus was done. It sees the disciples like, are you guys really following this guy? Because look, what are these people? He, why do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners. So these others were considered sinners. All the other gospels calls them sinners in verse number 29. Company of tax collectors and sinners reclining at table with them. How could Jesus be righteous and hang out with such a crowd? Wasn't having a feast with them mean he was accepting their lifestyle? Wasn't that what he was doing? So Jesus responds in verses 31 and 32. Jesus answered them, Those who, have, who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. These verses are so instructive and so important. These Pharisees think that they're righteous. Jesus is going to let them know pretty quickly by the end of the gospel, they're not. So they didn't need a physician in their minds because they're righteous. Of course, it's not that they were righteous, but it's in their minds they were righteous. So why would they need to be forgiven or healed, right? It's like the older gentleman, whoever he might be in your life, who everyone and their mom is encouraging to go see the doctor over X, Y, and Z. And in his mind, he's fine. Why would I go see the doctor? even though the growth that we're all looking at is like a softball in his arm, right? He doesn't, in his mind, he doesn't need a physician. And that's the point. At least Levi's crowd knew the truth. Do you know what they knew? They were sinners. Why? Because everyone thought they were sinners. Everyone called them out as sinners. They made sure they understood that. So why would... <laughs> Why wouldn't Jesus be with them and befriend them? Because they're the ones who need Jesus, is what he's saying. The people that think they're fine, they don't need Jesus in their minds, even though they do. And Jesus came to save sinners. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, and implying very, very pointedly, that you aren't going to be in my kingdom who you think you're righteous. I am not calling you. There's like so much. I thought about doing just a whole sermon on that. But let me just offer two quick points. From this little, little narrative in verses 27 through 32. Number one, when we've experienced Jesus, we naturally should bring others to Jesus. Don't you get that from Levi? I mean, he experienced Jesus, and the first thing he does is like, come on. you got to know about this guy. you got to learn about Jesus. Jesus had touched his life, and he has to bring others to, 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 to meet Jesus. The leper, same thing, right? I mean, the leper, he gets healed. It doesn't tell us in this passage, but we know from Mark chapter 1 that he immediately, he's like, I'm, I doesn't listen to the Lord, and he starts telling everybody about what Jesus had done for him. That is the natural response. It's not too hard to see where this is going, right? So I'll let someone else do it instead of me. From the reading of the Vine Project that we've been doing, it says this, we so easily settle into comfortable week-by-week -week church existence where we're happy to be together and to help each other grow as disciples of Christ and, to be frank, are reasonably content with the world around us continuing on its way to hell in a handbasket. We stop appreciating how deep is the prevailing darkness and how desperate and sad is the plight of millions who remain in darkness. Secondly, 
like Jesus, we're to be in the world and not of the world. We're to be in the world and not of the world. Jesus, there's just a, a great picture painted here in this feast. Having a meal with someone at that time was a big deal. You know, we eat on the go all the time. You ever been with a family that actually does meals right? Like two hours later, you're, it showed that you cared. To have a meal with someone for Jesus showed that he deeply cared for these people and was willing to face the scorn of the religious community by having a meal with them. I know for a fact, well, I don't know for a fact, because it's not a fact, it's conjecture. I know for conjecture that if Jesus did this today, the, the social media would be all over Jesus for his association. He would be seen as compromising. He's not compromising. He calls Levi to follow him, and I'm sure he's calling them to follow him. It's not compromising, but he loves them. And he cares for them. And they matter to him. And he wants them to know that they matter to him. So he sits and has a meal to the, to the scorn of all the religious righteous people that thought he was a terrible man for doing this. Later, they're going to accuse him of eating and drinking, having too much fun. Yeah, Christians never accuse anyone of that. But we are to be like Jesus in the world and not of the world. And listen, we will never reach this world if we completely isolate ourselves from this world. We have got to know our neighbors. We've got to feast with our neighbors. Yeah, but Pastor Dave, you don't know what they're like. I don't. I don't frankly care. We're called to reach. What an example of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Well, more could be said about these passages. Now you know why I went, I mean, there was no way I was going to get to chapter 6. But I pray maybe a little bit after today, you might praise Jesus a little bit more in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of Jesus. I mean, what a compassionate, forgiving, seeking Savior, thank you for his love. Help us to prize him above all else this week. In Christ's name, amen. As we close the service, uh, we are going to have a song, but before we do that, I'm going to ask...